Welcome back to another episode of the Sky Society podcast. Today, I'm so excited to be chatting with Candice Amos. She is a social media director, director, editor, and content strategist. She has worked at a um, quite impressive lineup of companies. So she's previously been at the New York Post as a reporter, um, worked at the New Year's New York Daily News as a social media editor, um, Mail Online, The Daily Beast, and The LA Times. So you have been all over and have so much experience. So I cannot wait to tap into your mind. Uh, before we jump into all of that, can you tell me a little bit about who you are, Candice? Yes, uh, Natalie, I'm so happy to be here today. As you said, I'm a social media director. Um, I started off my career as a reporter, um, but something about social media and how it just seemed to blossom around 2015, I felt like that was a space that I can grow in. And it has proven to be true. I've had um, several leadership roles in social where I'm setting a strategy for different news organizations. And um, as of late, uh, I'm just kind of seeing what else is outside of the social media space and, you know, business and marketing and tying all, all that in together. So. I think you're muted. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, whenever I take a sip of water, I always mute myself so you don't hear me gulp. <laughs> um, but thank you. Um, but yeah, Candice, yeah, you have definitely quite an impressive lineup. So I'm excited to go through. I think it's also interesting to hear the transition from like reporting or journaling or doing journalism to going into marketing. And especially if you got to experience that growth of social media where it wasn't really a career. And then now it kind of became this thing that everyone had to figure out. Yeah. But I'm going to take you way, way back. And we're going to go back to your role as a reporter at the New York Post. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your time there? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Way, way back. Um, that was like my first real job in media. I scrambled to get that job um, because when I went to college, I majored in English. So I had no journalism experience. Um, I actually got that job because I used to take the subway every day into the city. I lived in New York and you know I would go on interviews and wouldn't land anything. And I will always grab a New York Post before I got on the train. And there was oh. this reporter whose byline I would see over and over again. He had a very unique name and it was something about his work that just connected me to him. So I said, you know, I'm just going to randomly email this random stranger and tell him how impressed I am with his work and how I would love to work with him. And funny enough, he responded to my email and he said, oh my well, gosh, send me your resume. And I was just like, okay, I had nothing on my resume, <laughs> nothing impressive. Um, but he said, you know, send me your resume. I sent it. I didn't hear back from for three months. So I emailed him again, like, hey, did you get my resume? He said, yeah, I put it on um, our editor's desk. No one got back to you. I said, no. So that week I came in uh, for an interview and I had a job before the next Monday. So that's pretty much how my journalism career started by me just making a connection so you literally cold outreach to get your own job yes, yes. <laughs> that <would> happened <laughs> I so okay so much there first I love that you like took the initiative to go and do that because like most people would never do that because they would feel like oh you know they're probably getting hit up all the time there's no way they would see my email there's no way they would even you know notice me so kudos to you for being brave enough to do that and then the other thing you mentioned is that you followed up when you didn't hear back. I think so many people think that they're so they're too pushy if they follow up. But like you said, it was a like just a mistake, like an innocent yeah. mistake that they wouldn't have caught if you wouldn't have followed up and said something. And then the turnaround time after that seems like it was super quick. Yeah, yeah, I was lucky. I think they were in a process of hiring new editorial staff. So if I would have emailed them like two weeks later, I probably would have missed the boat. So I'm happy I took that chance. <laughs> wow. So timing was also a big part of it as well. Yeah. And is that what you knew you wanted to do out of college was go and be a reporter? Or did you have plans to do something else? 100%. I remember when I graduated and my two favorite teachers who I loved at the time, they had um, applications for grad school to be a teacher. And they rolled it up in like this little gift bag for me and was like, here, just, you know, open the gift later. And I, I saw it. I'm like, I do not want to be a teacher. 
Um, and I was just determined to kind of like follow this dream of mine. Actually, one of my final assignments was to create a marketing strategy for any type of business. And I chose a teen magazine for women and it was called Essence Teen. And funny enough, Essence has a younger um, magazine now called Girls United. Um, So I did like a full, it was like 40 pages. I had no clue. I put all these phony facts. I didn't know what I was doing, but I wanted to see this thing happen. Um, And yeah, when I came back to New York, I said, I have to make it in media. I don't care what I have to do, who I have to call. I'm going to make this dream a reality. That's incredible and really inspiring to hear that you you knew what you wanted and you went out and you made it happen and you did it in a way that wasn't, you know, just applying to a job on a job site. So I absolutely love that. Um, you were at the New York Post for seven, seven years, right? Yes, yes. I, I oh. want to be honest in this conversation because those were some hard years. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie when I went in I felt like you know I'm gonna be writing these cover stories I'm gonna be this awesome journalist no I was literally like fetching coffee from like uh, you know I would get salads from my bosses I would pass papers around in the office during meetings take notes so it took me a long time to prove myself to actually be able to showcase my ideas because it was just like shh shh, go in that corner We're, we're not listening to you so I really had to make connections within that newsroom so that they can see me as a strong voice and my lane was being young Um, being from a diverse background. So whenever we had these stories where we were covering that type of beat, I would be the expert on that. So they would just say, bring Candace in the room. I know she knows this person or I know she can relate to that group. Let's send her out on that story. And that's kind of how it all happened for me. Wow. It was was like, we love honesty on this guy's study podcast. So I'm glad you're saying that too, that it wasn't easy and glamorous. Like we, you know, in the movies or the TV shows that will portray it to be like, um, can you tell me a little bit about how you were able to make that transition from just being the, you know, the girl that grabbed coffee and took notes and who that, you know, no one wanted to hear your ideas to finally like getting to a place where you were respected and actually doing real editorial work. Yes. So as you can imagine, the New York Post as a newsroom was very intimidating. (laughs) Um, Definitely male dominated. We didn't have a lot of women in leadership, but there was one woman who I automatically kind of like gravitated toward. And she was one of our um, city desk editors. So she would just run the show every day and um, catch the spot news around the city. And I would just like, you know, try to talk to her all the time. And she would, you know, after a while, she was like, okay, I'll give you 15 minutes of my time. Um, And I just told her like, look, I have talent. I see what's going on. I see the operation. I feel like I can add to it. What do I have to do to get, you know, everyone to pay attention? And, you know, slowly but surely, she would start to send me out on stories. And, you know, being sent out on a story was a big deal back then, because that means that, you know, by the turn of the news, of the next day, you would have to be able to produce something. And there were so many people who had opportunities to go out on stories and they would fail. They would come back with nothing, no quotes, no nothing. Um, so, but for me, I was just really aggressive. And I said, I don't care what I have to do, where I have to go. They would send me the stories in Connecticut and I would drive my little car <laughs> um, from Brooklyn to Connecticut or New Jersey. Um, but yeah, I kept doing that. And then I realized that my real passion was more on culture and entertainment. So after a few years of doing these stories, I I pitched myself to be in the features department and lucky, you know, me making this connection with the editor, she was behind me and I was able to go into that department. And that's when my world changed. That's when, you know, the skies opened up for me. I was able to, you know, cover fashion week. Every day I was on the phone with a a celebrity. Like I'll never forget, Eve called me from her hotel in London and we had a conversation for an interview. Wow. Conversation for 30 minutes on the phone. And she said, I'm going to be in New York next week. Can we hang out? And I was like, me? Okay. (laughs) I mean, oh my gosh. Like that, you know, being able, I I interviewed so many amazing people. And at that point, I knew I wanted to be in a space that was more like entertainment and, you know, cultural things like that. So, 
Who are some of the favorite, your favorites that you got to interview or any interviews that really stand out that you got to do um, while you were, while you were at the uh, New York Post? Yes. Um, so one of my favorites was Kiki Palmer. Oh my gosh. I she her personality that stands out today was even bigger back then <laughs> because really? she had to prove herself. Um at the time she had a show. She was the youngest um TV show host on BET. And she kind of like made history. So I interviewed her about the show and everything and the talent and I mean, she was just amazing. Um, I also interviewed Nia Long. She was doing a series on Lifetime at the time. So yeah, there were a couple of like really big people. I interviewed Zendaya. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, and, and this was when she was just like a Nickelodeon, you know, type. I think, no, Disney. Um, so yeah, she was just kind of coming up. So I like that I can reflect on the journey for these stars before they really got big and to see where they are at now is just amazing, so... Yeah, that is such a cool, I can't imagine like having that job just being a really cool way to meet new people. And like you said, get to know stars. And then now like looking back and say like, they've changed so much since when I've talked to them or um, that must be like a really, really cool feeling to be able to experience. Sure. So you were there for about seven years. So is that is that pretty much what your role kind of evolved to while you were there? You started doing an assistant and then you became like an actual reporter you know, doing interviews with celebrities and focusing in on the entertainment industry. Yes, yes, yes. And um, from there, um, again, I wanted to continue to follow down that path of entertainment and celebrity. Uh, I took a job at Us Weekly. I'm not sure if that's on. My- yes. <laughs> but, yes, yes. <laughs> I took a job at Us Weekly. And this was when the magazine was just like the biggest thing. Um, people kind of like picked it up to read the latest gossip and I was on the digital side. So a lot of the headlines in the magazine, I had nothing to do with it, but <laughs> the, uh, you know, the work on online is what I did. Uh, so I covered a lot of fashion and beauty and health and lifestyle. Okay. So then you went, so it's kind of in a little bit of a different space then, because you were more in entertainment at the New York Post. Then you went more into like fashion, beauty, lifestyle at Us Weekly. And then you went over to New York Daily News and you were a social media editor there. So is this kind of when you made that transition from reporting to social media? Or can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so that was the first job um, I ever got poached for. Um, and that was a new experience of uh, being told like, hey, I want you to work for us. You don't have to do anything. Just come on over. Um, so, you know, they gave me an offer I couldn't refuse at the time. And yeah, he, the editor at the time, he was trying to figure out social media. He was trying to figure out what Facebook was going to be. And they, my initial title was a Facebook reporter. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, that essentially was catching the trending news on Facebook and reporting it. Um, but you know, that wasn't sustainable. And I turned into a social media editor. So creating the social media strategy, monitoring analytics, figuring out ways to make projects blossom on social Um, And then on top of that, I uh, inherited a team where I was managing anywhere from like four to six people, um, hiring. It it was a big job. And I mean, when I got it, I said, this is crazy. I don't know if I'm qualified to do this, but okay. Um, Because I was actually (laughs) promoted into that position. And after that, I kind of just clung on to leadership. And I realized that there needs to be a leader who looks like me. There needs to be a leader who's a woman who can relate to all different types of people. Um, and I feel like, you know, soft skills wasn't a term that was really popular back then, but that was like the missing link that, you know, these companies needed. They needed someone to be soft, someone that can relate um, on on a very ground level with different people around on the newsroom. And Uh, people that can kind of like talk to people and figure out what their problems are and how to find solutions. So I think that's kind of been my lane since then. This is kind of when you realize that leadership is where your, your skill set fit best or or kind of where you found the most passion. Right. Right. And then you mentioned having, you know, leaders that look like you, what was it like, you know, in this space way back then, which I can only imagine is a lot different now different than it is today um of you know did you feel very alone did you feel very isolated or what was your experience yeah 100 percent um I like to say that I'm still recovering from career PTSD because I had so much fear 
I had so much fear because I also felt like I wasn't qualified to be in these spaces. Um, you know, I was really like gunning for jobs, uh, you know, the same jobs that people at Columbia and NYU and, you know, they would, I would be training them and things like that. So I had to, I guess, empower myself at the time. Um, but it, yes, it was very lonely. I had one friend who we were very similar, uh, both from Brooklyn, um, diverse backgrounds, and um, I would confide in her and she would confide in me every time we had a challenge. She went through a lot. I went through a lot. Uh, we actually came together um, because uh, at the end of our tenure um, at the Daily News, we got we got laid off. <laughs> mm -hmm. So so they laid off 50 percent of the staff and we came. together. Oh. Yeah, and you can't escape it in this industry. And um, we came together and created a, a publication for for young women um, that were in their 30s. So, you know, I think it's important to have somebody that you can connect with, someone that you can be real with, because sometimes you look around and you can't be yourself. You know, people will see you as a certain way and want to put you in a box. So, yeah. So you mentioned some career PTSD before, so obviously, I you know, like I think we made a lot of change now, but it, you know, it's still not where it should be. Do you have advice for someone that's maybe kind of feeling like how you felt at the start of their career that they feel alone, that there's no one there in leadership or at the company that looks like them, and they feel like you know that imposter syndrome where they they have to fight a lot harder to to get where they want to be? Do you do you have any advice for for someone like that? Yes, and this is some advice I wish I would have taken, and that is get a mentor. Um, I traveled most of my career alone because I was so afraid. Um, and I think having somebody, and I actually had uh, invitations to actually meet with people and have mentors, but I, I just felt like, no, I got to put my head down. I got to grind. I don't have time for that. But there should be time for that personal development where you're looking inside yourself and seeing where your areas of strength are. And sometimes you can't do that alone and you need someone that you can depend on. So you can find a mentor through, you know, your alumni associations at school. Um, for me, I'm also in a sorority. So I could have, you know, found someone within my sorority that was in my field. Um, also, uh, people who leave companies, they go on to do great things and then you want to reach out to them, but you're like, no, I don't, this is going to be weird, but it's okay to kind of just make that introduction. Cause you don't know what it could turn into. So mentors are number one for me. I'm really glad that you said that. And I think what you said there about not prioritizing it is very relatable because there's so many, you know, you, everyone, you want to focus on the things that are, you know, catching on fire in front of you or that are the shiniest objects, but I think that because getting a mentor, finding a mentor that you actually connect with takes time. That doesn't just, you know, come naturally. You have to put in work. You have to meet with multiple people. You have to, you know, get put yourself out there and ask different people. But I think what you said there is very important that you you don't have to go through it alone. And that I think there's a lot of great people, um, you being one of them, that are willing to help others. And all you have to do is ask. So you were there on the social team. So essentially you built out the social team at the Daily News, is that correct? Yes. So we had an audience development leader, uh, but he got so busy with his work. So they kind of like handed the reins to me for social. Um, but yeah, ever since then, since 2015, I was in management hiring uh, different folks to come in and help with our social media operation. Yeah. And when you, so you mentioned that you got laid off, 50% of the workforce got laid off. And I'm imagining this one at a time when news just because of, of social media like just the landscape was changing just in that industry yeah that that was the pivot to video era <laughs> so, <laughs> pivoted to video and you know we got pivoted out the office and you know it was hard um because again when you make these changes to your strategy you have to learn these things right you have to learn how to create engaging video how to edit how to you know solicit talent all of that um, and when you're told that, you know, this operation actually isn't bringing us any money, um, you know, it hurts a little, it stings a little bit. Um, and I think that was a lesson for me to always check in with my, what my value is, you know, for my role. So then I became, you know, let me just investigate and see what's happening in the industry around me. I would, you know, look for roles, even if I was happy. I would always be looking and taking interviews and meetings and just seeing what the landscape is um, because things can change. And again, with your head being down, you don't really know and see that. So. 
Yeah, that's a really a good lesson you took away from that is maybe being more proactive of what's happening and in your industry, but also in the job market, right? So I have had some girls reach out to me, like my company just did layoffs. Like I, I saw my job, but what should I do to be, you know, what if I'm in the next round of layoffs? And so I think being proactive, like of kind of like what you said, and not just, you know, hoping all is the best and then, you know, not being prepared. And sometimes it does come out of nowhere and there's, you know, nothing you could have done to, to, prepare for that. But I think your advice there of just, you know, be looking, be looking at your industry, be aware of what's around you and not just have tunnel vision on your, your role. Yeah. Yeah. So you, after you got laid off, is this, so you then ended up going to mail online for a couple of months before you then went over to the daily beast. What was that layoff time like for you? Did you take time to yourself first before going on the job hunt? Did you like immediately try to find work or what were the steps that you took? So with that layoff, um, I didn't have the confidence that I have now. So I was just aggressively looking for work. Um, And at that time, audience development was the hottest thing on the block. So everyone had these audience development roles. Um, And that was like my next thing. I said, all right, I did social media. Let's see what audience development is about. And, you know, now I look at it, it really wasn't much of a difference. (laughs) It's the same thing. (laughs) Um, you're just using different platforms. Uh, but yeah, so I wanted to get some experience with that. But the good thing with audience development is that it taught me um, how to shepherd partnerships. So I had uh, I had to work with like Apple News, Smart News, um, uh, Yahoo, all of these networks where we had uh, these uh, revenue share businesses with them where we would produce our content for their website. And we would split, you know, the advertising revenue. So um, at that point in time, I was just like pitching our content directly to this these sites to be featured on there um, and looking for ways to kind of like grow business on both ends. Wow. Okay. So a little bit of a, of a pivot into this audience development editor. I haven't seen a title like, do you know if that's still a job title that's around? Not really. I have not seen it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my high level thing because it does ties into the business side. Um, but back then it was more like, you know, if you're in social, this could be something you could do, but now it's, it's very high level. Got it. Okay. So then we're going on, we're going on another, another new role. <laughs> another so <journey. laughs> I love it though. But for most of these roles, you were there for a significant amount of time. It wasn't like you were job hunting, like you you were you were there for for a couple of years. So you're at the Daily Beast. You were there for almost three years. Um, same similar role, audience development and social media. And I think this is where you started to get involved with more of the video sites like TikTok. Is that yes, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So tell me about your role here. Um. Uh, oh my gosh, the Daily Beast will always have a place in my heart. I love that newsroom. It was the most like down to earth and inclusive of just people's lifestyles. Um, and I really felt, you know, like we were a quote unquote family. Um, it was very organic there. And um, yeah, at the Daily Beast, it was, we were a small but mighty team. We had a huge like impact on media at the time. There was a lot going on in this space. Um, and we were experimenting left and right. We experimented with podcasts. Um, there was one podcast uh, called The New Abnormal, which, um, you know, we had actually, before I got there, they experimented with a podcast and it instantly flopped and they said, we're never doing this again. Um, but, you know, someone pitched this idea and I, I'll never forget my editor at the time. He came to me like, hey, I have this project. I can't tell you what the name is. I can't tell you who the host is, but you need to create a social strategy for this. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, can you tell me what it's about? just just use our voice and I'm like okay so I just you know created this document with a lot of blanks um and then like a week later he's like okay this is what the show is this is who the host is fill in the gaps um and it ended up being a huge success I mean like thousands and thousands of downloads per week um I remember when we debuted it landed like in the top 10 of Apple all Apple podcasts Um, And that was just like unheard of for a news outlet at the time. Um, And I just felt really great because a lot of that traffic came from social media. So, you know, a lot of our work became like, okay, let's promote this podcast in any way we can on Instagram, on Twitter. And people would look for our posts announcing the latest episode. Like they would freak out. 
yeah, we actually launched a um a podcast Twitter account, and like within the first couple of weeks, we had like twenty thousand followers. Oh, but these people, like, it was crazy. Um, so that was really great. Uh, we also experimented with TikTok. Um, I kind of had to persuade the newsroom. They were just like, oh, why, why are we on TikTok? I'm like, we should just try it. Um, and I remember I posted one video and that was when you could go viral instantly. And we got like 30,000 followers overnight. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, and after that, you know, um, it was just, it was, I mean, it was just like an endless, like ream of just different tests um, in different aspects of the newsroom. Um, but what I really loved there was growing my team. I had the best team in the business, and that's no lie. Um, people that were really passionate about the work that they were doing, and they wanted to grow. Like, they were just like, okay, I've mastered this. What's next? So I like that we were all growing together as a unit, and we're still really close. Um, and we kind of look out for each other, even though we've all gone different places. Um, but yeah, that was one of the better experiences in my career in media. Oh, I can tell just the way you're talking about it that you absolutely loved it there. So I loved hearing the energy in your voice. So you mentioned that you had one of the best teams in the business. Did you, were you the manager? Did you hire for those roles or were you on the team? I had the luxury of hiring for those roles. And I feel like that's not something that a lot of people get a chance to do. Um, so yeah, hiring from the very beginning, actually like writing the job description, uh, figuring out what we needed on our team, what was missing, um, and, you know, we had some great talent. Um, and yeah, I was able to manage them throughout. And yeah, they're they're in some amazing places now. So I'm really proud of them. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. When so when you're, you're going out and you're trying to build this team, which looks like it was an absolute success. What are things that you look for in candidates? Or how can you tell if you found someone that's really special? Yes. Um, so I look for, I'll give examples. One, someone that is not afraid, meaning that they are willing to challenge the norm <laughs> of, you know, what's right. So I had one candidate who she just, she just got the job. Like she just sold the job. It wasn't a lot of work to hire her because I couldn't like not hire her. Um, she made herself look that good. Um, so she like the first email, Hey, I want to work for you. This is what I've done. Boom, 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 boom. Like it was just immediate. And when she came in for the interview, we had like several rounds. She brought that same energy. Um, and every person that I've hired, they, they've gone that route with, by just being just outgoing and aggressive in their approach. So I think that a lot of people tend to hope that the system works for them. Like, okay, I'm just going to submit my resume and hopefully I hear back. No, you have to just go out there and be aggressive. Um, I also look for just a diverse set of skills. So yes, being a great writer and a communicator is number one, but also do you have, uh, you know, have you dabbled in video or audio? Um, do you have a YouTube channel? Like I like to see that unique skill set that the whole world actually needs. Uh, we may not need it in news, but I know that, you know, having a YouTube channel and actually like having an audience there, that's a valuable skill set. It shows that you know how to build community. Um, and that's just the key to growth in media, period. Uh, so, yeah, I look for those unique skills. Also, just like a great attitude. Um, you don't have to like kind of like shape shift or be something that you're not. But just being like, hey, I want to do this. And I know that people are looking to grow their career. So you don't have to act like, oh, you know, this company that I'm working for is on this pedestal. No, we're, it's about you and it's about the company and it's about how we can work together. So, yeah. yeah. Um, that's, that's really awesome to hear that. And, and just like you going through all those different uh, metrics, what you look for, I, it's not just, you know, X amount of, of experience in this degree, right? It's, it's, uh, it's more about their personality and, and who they are. Do you have advice for people that are on the job hunt right now and they are looking to stand out, right? You said maybe, you know, you can't just trust the system to, to, you know, take you through, like, what are some things that they can do in the job search process to really showcase their personality or to really stand out and, and be seen from these, the hiring manager? Yes, yes. Um, so I would say first things first, um, just getting it out the way, just make sure your resume is great. Um, I feel like sometimes we undersell ourselves. We don't really like bring our all to uh, showcasing all that we've done. So take the time to make sure that your resume really reflects how amazing you are. 
Um, then get the concept of a career being linear, kind of like out of your head, because that's no longer a thing. Mm -hmm. And there's no like failure or, you know, being a success. We're all just grinding every day. So I don't, I feel like it really um, makes you stand out when you look at yourself as a business. And when I am in interviews, I talk like that. I'm like, how can I make you some money? What do I have to do? I see that, you know, you're on this platform. Here's a suggestion for you to grow there. Or how's your bottom line? How's your newsletter? How I ask those types of questions. So your job may be like a functional job where you're like a, a marketing manager. But if you can think bigger than that, think about the marketplace. Think about the company's competitors and how you can add value in that way. Um, also, if you're a fan of the company or you're a fan of, you know, different products in the market, if it's you're gunning for a position for a fashion line, what can you add to that as a person who loves fashion? How can you show that I would be perfectly okay in this world because I'm actually a fan of this? Um, so I think just showing that you organically mesh with what the company is doing um, and also just bringing enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, listen, I have like went hard for people who maybe didn't have the best resume or anything like that. But when they showed up to that interview, they wowed me with their personality. I'm like, I don't care. Let's bring them in for a second interview. I'll give them another shot. So if you have that enthusiasm and all the other stuff, I think you'll be good to go. Yeah. I, yeah. Covering the basics and making sure your resume is looking great, but also um, being able to, I show your enthusiasm. I always say enthusiasm overcomes fear. And if you have interview jitters, just like being super excited, enthusiastic is contagious. And I feel like that energy too, especially if someone's been interviewing for a long time and then a candidate comes in and they just look really excited to be there. I think it can really, um, it can really go to your advantage to, to have that energy and, and really show them that you, you, you really, really care about this and, and want this opportunity. So you got to build your dream team. You got to hire all these incredible people, um, bring them together. And it looks like work on a lot of innovative projects and, and really try new things, which honestly, I can tell why that was definitely a whole, just that role held a special place in your heart. Um, but you then moved on to the LA Times, Los Angeles Times, um, as a deputy editor for social media. Can you tell me about your your switch there? And then is this were, were all your roles in New York and then you went to the LA Times? Was that in yeah. LA? Yes. So, so the you moved LA too. Time, so okay. I have not moved. Okay. <laughs> Lucky for me, um, when I uh so the LA Times came to me for this opportunity and I was living in Texas at the time. So I'm just like, mm, I don't know how this is gonna work out, but I'll I'll talk, we'll see what happens. Um, but um I was able to get the job and it was very hands-on. Um, the team was kind of like put together. So I was building the morale of this team. So everyone was kind of like doing their own thing. There was no like connection between the people on the team. So I spent a lot of time just working with them one-on-one -on -one and, and coming together as a team and, and making sure that, you know, they know that yes, the company has a mission, but we have our own mission as a team. And that is to produce the best work that we can for our audience. Um, so yeah, I was in that role for a year and a half. Um, we just had a layoff <laughs> last week, which was very hard because so many talented people lost their jobs due to you know the economy right now. Um, so it's it's really rough in media. And again, I think that it's important to kind of again look outside of what's happening in that world. Um, so yeah, that, that was like, it was a good run and I'm really proud of the work that we, we were able to do. Um, but then the first week my boss said, look, we have this, uh, this project that we need you to lead social on. It's called Behold. It's a project because it came about, um, after George Floyd and we wanted to kind of like showcase our show of just, you know, connection with the black community in LA. And, you know, they said, we need you to lead social. So from that, I was able to, you know, work with the people involved with the project. So it was a photo based project. We had a live activation in LA during Juneteenth weekend. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, so I would say that the LA times is a place that 
the news is the news. That's like a separate business, but there are all these other things going on from podcasts to video series to actual events such as like the food bowl and, you know, festival of books. And we, we just had all of these amazing things going on and it, it was really great to play a part in that. Wow. That, that definitely sounds like exciting projects and campaigns you got to work on. And I'm, I'm really sad to hear that your time there got cut short. Um, Candace actually emailed me like this, her layoff just happened. So it's fresh. So I also appreciate you like coming on and talking about it. Cause I know it can't be easy. And so I, I really appreciate you being vulnerable and, and sharing this with us. Can you tell me how this layoff is different for you than the one that you encountered previously in your career? Oh, I'm so happy you asked me this question <laughs> um, because I was reflecting on that today. Um, I think back then I couldn't see opportunity. With this layoff, I see opportunity all around me. Um, this year, I was invited to participate in this leadership cohort with some of the biggest people in media. And I was able to tap into that network instantly where they're just like, hey, let, let's let's chat. Let's see what we can do. Um, just my presence on LinkedIn, I received so many just DMs and messages and just kind words of support and people saying, hey, I'm looking out for you or are you interested in this opportunity? So I'm glad that I've made myself known in this industry and people have faith in my abilities. And I don't think I'm going to be off the market too long. Hopefully not. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm I'm just hoping that I can try to I can kind of get back out there and start working again. But I'm looking at myself now as more of a business. Back then, I was more so like, how can I get another job? How can I work for someone else doing the same thing? Now I'm just like, the sky is the limit. I think it's really inspiring to hear that because rejection sucks like even I'm sure even this second time around it it also sucked um but I think what's important to take from that is that it you know it doesn't have any reflection on your worth or your abilities or who you are as a person and it's exciting to hear that this time you're taking it as an opportunity to say okay where else can I grow and and take my career because um I know that you know it's never what anyone expects or plans and it I'm sure it, it's hard not to for not to take it personally or not to feel like it's a you know a personal mark on on your character so it is exciting to hear and even that even that confidence of I'm not going to be on the market for too long. I... <laughs> Hopefully, you know, who knows? <laughs> we, we love it. Um, but I think especially right now, because we're in this like weird thing with COVID where it was like COVID hit all the layoffs. Then there was this like boom of everyone hiring again. And then I feel like we're kind of in this, like, I hope it's going to plateau. I hope it's not going to go back yeah. down, but I feel like it's kind of this like equilibrium of companies like hired a lot. And then they're like, okay, wait, and so we're, I'm trying to see layoffs. Like I know on LinkedIn, I've been seeing it. I've had other guests that were scheduled to record, unfortunately, also rescheduled because they're like, okay, you know, yeah, the, I, I got laid off. Not I have to, to the confidence, you know, I, I, yeah. was, I was trying to figure out, okay, do I, ha what can I say of value? Um, but then I have to realize that, well, I had to realize that, you know, this is not anything singular to me. Everyone is going through this and we should look mm -hmm. at this as like a community event. How can we help each other right now? How, if you have a job, can you put in a good word for someone? If you're looking for a job, um, you know, what can you do to make that process easier for yourself? And if that's like finding resources or connections on LinkedIn or Twitter, then do that. Um, I don't, I don't look at it as a mark of shame or anything like that, because as you said, it's, it was really beyond my control. It was, for me, it was like I was one of the most recent hires. So that's just how it kind of goes sometimes. So yeah. yeah, I don't think, you know, taking it personal is is necessary, you know? So um, um, one of the other things I wanted to comment on, I wanted to do this at the beginning of the podcast, but your LinkedIn um like headline, you met you have two things in there, or three things actually that <laughs> stick out to me that I want I love for you to touch on. Um so you have career BFF ideas queen and then I help you get out of your own way can you tell me a little bit more about what those mean to you yeah so a career bff I'm everyone's like big sister <laughs> um I can't tell you how many emails and dms I get from people and I actually build relationships out of this um just helping people you know figure out their next moves whether that's pitching a story or a project idea 
Um, I like to help people and I like to be a resource because when I started, I didn't have that. So, you know, that's where that comes from. And ideas queen, I am like, I say the boldest stuff in meetings <laughs> to the point where like my, my recent job, my, my boss would just be like, wow, Candace, like, wow. <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I kind of like to think outside the box. I like to challenge ideas and I'm always thinking about the, the audience or the consumer, you know, if I'm just like, okay, why, why are we doing this? You know? So I like to uh, get people, you know, their uh, will spinning. And the last one was I help people get out their own way. And I actually do that. I'm very honest. I'm very direct. And I'm even that way with myself. Um, I don't think many of us spend the time that we need to develop. And that's like a true practice. You have to spend the time either, you know, reading books or listening to podcasts like this to soak up the resources. Because if you're just doing the job that you are ha that you're assigned to do every day, you aren't growing. You're not growing out of that. Um, so I like to kind of like push the boundaries, make people see the impossible. I just had well, one of my friends now, she's she's a friend now. Um, she lives in Trinidad and she is building her career in journalism and media. And she just wrote a story in Teen Vogue with um, Haley Bailey for uh, The Little Mermaid. And she, oh my got, gosh. she went to LA, she walked the red carpet, all of this stuff. And, you know, just a month prior, she said, I want to write this story. Who can I pitch it to? You know, and I said, you know, try these outlets and Teen Vogue was the one who picked it up. So, you know, I'm kind of like, I don't believe in, you know, the impossible. Everything is possible. You just have to make the right strategy, uh, create that plan and make the right connections. Um, so yeah, that's what I mean when I say I'm, I'm like an ideas queen and I like to help people get out of their own way. I love it. You're giving me energy just hearing you talk about it. <laughs> what do you think is like the number one way if you're, you're, you know, someone's coming to you maybe for mentorship or they're asking for help? Like, how do you think we get in our own way the most? Like how are, how are most people kind of, yeah, getting in their own way and holding themselves back? Yes. Um, the number one way is putting themselves in a box. Like, I can't tell you how many times I speak to people and they're like, I'm known for this one thing. That means I have to do it until death. <laughs> I'm just like, it doesn't have to work that way. You are human. <laughs> you have, you know, different facets of your personality and you should explore that. So you might be a journalist, but maybe you want to write a novel in a year. Why can't you? You know, if this is something that you want to do, um, you just need to kind of figure out what that path looks like, figure out the balance that is required to do the work in your life and, you know, just just figure it out. So I like to kind of just, you know, again, sky's the limit philosophy and just seeing what's out there and just don't give up. Just keep going until you accomplish your dreams. Okay. I think that's a perfect bow to the end of this episode. That was so awesome, Candice. Um, thank you again for coming on and sharing your career journey and even um, coming on here at a vulnerable time in your career and just inspiring me and our audience. I absolutely appreciate it. Thank you so much, Natalie. I enjoyed it.